Welcome back, one and all, to the Founded on Christ podcast. You're here with Curtis, a fellow traveler on this path of discipleship to the the Lord, to our Master, to the law and the mercy and the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And uh, thank you for returning. <laughs> um, as always, just a quick reminder that I have the email account founded on Christ Podcast at gmail.com, an open forum for you to give your experiences of following Christ, your experiences of what He's put into your heart, and how that has affected and, and changed you. Also, a nice reminder here at the top that I am not needed <laughs> uh, for this journey. I'm grateful for all, for all of you that come and listen. I'm grateful for uh, the time you take set aside. And hopefully, you know, I know I get a little long-witted at some point, but I'd like to return back to my roots a little bit of being a little shorter form here, a little pick-me-up. But uh, just a, a reminder that if nothing else, if when you see that Founded on Christ has released another episode... And you see that, you know, it's been 10, 15, 30 minutes, you know, an hour sometimes, depending on who's on here with us. If you do nothing other than take that amount of time and pray, earnestly pray and connect with your Father in Heaven, uh, you would probably be much better suited. <laughs> uh, I strive to do what I can and to be a reminder of that and everything that I'm doing here. But it's a good reminder that I am, I'm a small cog in this. And if my, my ultimate goal here is that you will find the desire within your heart to connect and follow the savior above all else this week, I've had a, a growing feeling, something I need to talk about. Um, as always, <laughs> I'll start off with the scripture. Proverbs 18, verse 2 says, A fool hath no delight in understanding, but that his heart may discover itself. Which sounds very uh, difficult to understand what that means. But uh, as I've studied, because I, I listened to this and I wanted to understand it a little better, I went and looked at what that verse means. Basically, what this verse is saying a fool has no delight in understanding, but seeks to proclaim his own opinion. And uh, that's something I'm very cognizant of on this podcast. But it's something I fear that as members of the church, as members of Restoration Branches, as members of Christianity, that we get caught up in this a little bit too much. I'm going to read a few more scriptures here about understanding. Uh, Proverbs 2, verse 2. So that thou incline thine ear unto wisdom, and apply thine heart to understanding. And 2 Timothy 2, verse 7. Consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. These verses here remind me that understanding is a godly attribute. And I've long discovered that there is a big difference between acceptance and tolerance of other people. And for me, tolerance, uh, and I don't mean that in a, a, like tolerating something bad, but tolerance as in understanding or getting to know or, or coming to meet other people on their level. This is something that <clears throat> religion in general struggles to do all the time. This is something Christian sex, especially it seems because of the nature of Christianity, uh, we have a hard time doing with each other. And I even see this more so in the church with the amount of light and truth that we feel that we have received. 
there is a tendency to add this air of superiority to ourselves. And when it comes to people who think or believe differently than ourselves, to, even if it's subconscious, look down our nose ecclesiastically at those people and consider ourselves higher or uh, in a better state than what they are. Uh, going along with this, Ephesians chapter 4, 17 and 18. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their minds. And it's important to recognize that we are the Gentiles. We are the Latter-day Gentiles. So this has a particular meaning to us, even though technically this is talking about the Gentiles at this time with Paul in Ephesus. But I think this still works and applies for us. Do we walk as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of our minds? Verse 18, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And then to kind of cap off this idea before I kind of go into the story that I want to, in the scriptures here, Matthew 7, verse 12, the, the golden rule there. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye do that men should do to you, do you even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. So, combining this all together, I wonder how well, as people who feel like we have a greater understanding of the Lord and Savior through both the Book of Mormon and the Bible, through the Doctrine and Covenants, through the added resources that we have, do we tend to get ourselves caught up in our own vanity and in our own superiority and we treat others less than they are because of it? And I think most people will hear this and they'll instantly rebuff it, as I probably would as well. But I think one of the things we will be most cl- most closely judged on is how we treat those whom have left our faiths. How we treat those who believe and feel and think differently than what we do, even if in our minds they have less of the truth than we do. So a very poignant example of this. And I think this scripture is in the Book of Mormon for a very specific reason. (laughs) Well, a few, obviously. But uh, Alma 31, and this is when Alma goes to the Zoramites. We're going to look at verse 13. For they had built a place in the center of their synagogue, a place for, for standing which was high above the head, and the top thereof would only admit one person. If that sounds kind of familiar, uh, maybe think of a pulpit. That is not far off. <laughs> if, it, if this seems a little pointed, it's supposed to be. That's the idea. The scriptures are supposed to be pointed at us. Therefore, whoso desired to worship must go forth and stand upon the top thereof and stretch forth their hands towards the heaven and cry with a loud voice, saying, Now there will be some differences, and that's a good example. We don't go up to the pulpit and lift our hands up into the air and cry to the to the heavens. But... We do go to the pulpit, and we pray, and we speak, and we teach from the pulpit. And verse 15 through 18, this is what the Zoramites say. Holy, holy God, we believe that thou art God, and we believe that thou art holy, and that thou wast a spirit, and thou art a spirit, and thou wilt be a spirit forever. Holy God, we believe that thou separated us from our brethren, and we do not believe in the tradition of our brethren which was handed down to them by the childishness of their fathers. But we believe that thou hast elected us to be thy holy children, and also thou hast made it known unto us that there shall be no Christ. But thou art the same yesterday, today, and forever. Thou hast elected us that we shall be saved, whilst all around us are elected to be cast down by the wrath wrath down to hell. For the which holiness, O God, we thank thee, And we also thank thee that thou hast elected us, that we may not be led away after the foolishness, foolish traditions of our brethren, which doth bind them down to a belief of Christ, which doth lead their hearts to wander far from thee, our God. And again, we thank thee, O God, that thou art chosen and a holy people. Amen. 
So listening to that, I think you can find some aspects of our own religion, and then you can see where the falsehood is. They claim to be the children of God. They claim to be the elect. They claim to not believe in the foolish traditions of their fathers, right? But even more pointedly against them, in the next chapter, in verse 3, it talks about the people who had helped build the synagogues, who they viewed to be less than them. It says, therefore, they were not permitted to enter into the synagogues to worship God, being esteemed as filthiness. Therefore, they were poor. Yea, they were esteemed by their brethren as dross. Therefore, they were poor as to the things of the world, and also they were poor in heart. Now, we find that this was actually good for these people, because it opened their hearts and minds to Alma as he's preaching. But... I think we need to look at this story. I think it's very easy for us to look at this and consider ourselves to be these people, right, who have been cast out of the synagogues. But I think it is equally important when we have a, a story in the Book of Mormon of people who are both oppressing and being oppressed, we need to see how we fall into both categories. So I would w ask everyone who's listening, you who is sitting on your chair, you know, playing a game on your iPad, listening to this, how are you like the Zoramites? Have you ever, whether by direct action or by indirect action, made somebody feel like they couldn't come to church or that they weren't valued the same as you? And maybe it wasn't direct. Maybe it was to other people. You talked about that person. To you who's sitting at work, you know, getting some stuff done, listening to this, have you ever, in a group of friends, talked about another person who may be going through a different faith crisis, who may be shifting their beliefs? Have you talked about that person disparagingly? Have you looked down your nose at them? Maybe even felt anger towards them for putting, quote-unquote, putting themselves in that situation. You who are uh, sitting at home, you know, maybe your kids are gone off to school and you have a chance to sit down and listen. When was the last time that in Relief Society we talked about people who left the church as less than us because of, for whatever reason, they have shifted and nuanced their faith from the same things that we do, but yet we gossip and talk about them and and we disparage the journey that they're on. That may seem harsh, that may seem pointed, but I find less and less as we get closer to what seems to be the end of days, I see people less and less striving to understand one another and more and more seeking to condemn and judge one another for their beliefs. Odds are pretty good at this stage that there is multiple people within your sphere of influence who believe and think differently than you do. And odds are pretty good that you may struggle to connect with those people sometimes. You, it, it will oftentimes beliefs are at odds with each other. They come in contrast with each other and we become very attached to them, become very inflamed by these beliefs to the point that we lose our Christian attitudes of love and understanding with each other. So my challenge to you, if you have somebody in your sphere of influence who doesn't believe the same way that you do, whether it is a parent, a child, a sibling, a relative, a friend, a co-worker, uh, you know, within reason and a pro uh, propriety, you know, as as situation permits in this day and age. Next time you have the opportunity, I encourage you to full-heartedly ask that person what they believe and why they believe it. Not with the attitude of seeking to change or push or or coerce them into a way, uh, any way of believing, but just to understand, to have an opportunity to receive empathy and to walk in another person's shoes. Uh, 
going back a couple weeks, this is, I am encouraging you to be a lamb in this moment. I think I've seen uh, the effects of both. I've seen people who were, who have hardened their hearts against people who believe differently than them. And it's usually, quite frankly, it is the most poignant when it is somebody who has left your belief system and has changed it and decided to go a different way. Those seem to be the hardest of these. And I've seen hardened hearts on both ends, and I've seen the destructive nature that that causes to relationships. I've also been party to and seen opportunities where people believe completely different things, but they're willing to openly talk about why they do, what has caused them to believe those things. And I have seen hearts knit together. I've seen people who believe completely different things be able to come across those divides and to stand together firm in the things that we agree or that they agree on, you know, and we, <laughs> that we agree on. It should be us as well. I am in my shame extremely guilty of this. It is something that even though I've always been interested in people and and why they think the way they do and I've strived for understanding, I have very much gotten caught up in my own way of thinking and believing. I have on podcast previous, you know, if you go back to the Ears to Hear podcast, you can hear it there with us. We have looked down our nose at people who think and believe differently than we do. And it's hard. It is so hard to find the balance of being bold for Christ, but being understanding it. And I personally want to express my sorrow. If anyone listening on any of these channels that I've ever recorded my voice to, if you've ever felt that I have disparaged your faith, I want to apologize and ask for your forgiveness because I am still seeking to apply this principle more fully in my life. My current feeling is, at this stage in the game, before things really pop off and get crazy, we have more to gain by listening and understanding one another than we do by casting each other out of our synagogues because of the filthiness that we see in them. One of the biting criticisms against the Jews was how they treated the Samaritans. It's the reason why when Christ gave example, you know, the good, good Samaritan example, it was a Samaritan. It was showing them that through the people that are, that had been cast out because of their belief system, they had been esteemed as filthiness in their synagogues, were cast out how they had value, they had goodness, they had light there to partake of, and that Christ wanted them to have that, to partake of that. So each and every one of us, as hard as it is, we need to go back, read this scripture with Alma and the Zoramites, and ask ourselves, how am I acting like the Zoramites in this situation? How am I getting caught up on truths and my own words mingled together to create myself in this holy position where I think that I am holier or higher or that I am on the right track and these people are wrong? How am I like that? Where is it that I need to repent of this? And how can I show a greater show of love and understanding towards the people, especially those who don't believe the same way that we do. When the stuff really hits the fan, I think the least question we'll be asking people <laughs> is their specific beliefs. We'll be hopefully being drawn together in love because of the hard things that will be placed upon our shoulders to bear. We will oversee our differences, and we will band together in the things that we hold common. That is my message today. That is my hope today, to encourage each and every one of us to seek for understanding. I believe that to be one of the attributes of Christ, a Christ-like attribute. I believe it to be 
an attribute of light. I believe it to be an eternal principle that God possesses himself. Because, quite frankly, he does it with us. He understands the law. He understands the universe infinitely better than we do. And we are so much lower on that. And we get it wrong all the time. And we think we have it right. We're so convinced in our hearts that we've been given the truth and we know the truth and we follow that and we follow after it and we make mistakes and we are wrong. God has it 100% right, but yet he comes and he, he reaches each and every one of us in our specific situations. He slowly brings us into truth. He doesn't disparage us because of the truth we don't have. He doesn't cast us out from his, his love because we don't understand the same things. He doesn't divide us. He seeks to unite us. And as we draw closer to him, those things are naturally stripped away from us. So please, my friends, be good to one another. <laughs> Understand one another. Take the time. I promise it is beautiful when it is done in the right spirit. And seek his face continually. I testify of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.